thanks for dropping in. If you saw my April Fool's Day video, you'll recognize this model. It's a so-called 3D printed cityscape that happens to look a lot like a QR code. No, it wasn't a prank or a rickroll. The brave few who scanned this code got early access to a prototype of my newest design. The Hexglyph Puzzle Box. Now it's time to share the final model with everyone, even those who foolishly doubted my pure intentions. The Hexglyph Puzzle Box is a print-in-place design. That means that you can make your own copy without knowing the puzzle's solution. For those who want to take on that challenge, this video will be split into two parts. The first half will avoid spoiling the puzzle's solution, focusing instead on how to get a good print. The second half will be a step-by-step -step guide to solving the puzzle. Okay, let's start with the non-spoiler stuff. The goal is simple. Open the box. There's no prize inside, but there is space to add your own reward for the next solver. Those familiar with 3D printed puzzles know the rules. No external tools, no extreme force, and no prying or breaking parts. If a section of the puzzle doesn't move easily, keep on looking. You're not on the right track. Here's what you need to know to get a good print. Don't add supports or brims. They'll just clog up the puzzle mechanism. You'll need a well-tuned printer that produces consistent surfaces, can easily print 0.4 millimeter clearances, and won't string. Avoid the more brittle types of PLA filament, like silks, wooden fill, or matte formulations. These can look nice, but they're less reliable on mechanical prints. Stick to an 100% scale for your first attempt. This puzzle can work at larger and smaller scales, but it's best not to push it until you understand how the puzzle works. Check that the first few layers are printing cleanly. If something's going to go wrong, it'll probably start there. My recommended print settings are pretty standard. I used 15% infill, 0.2 millimeter layer heights, and two perimeter walls. If you want to get fancy, you can add a slight fuzzy skin to the puzzle case. Just make sure it's set to only affect outer surfaces. My copy of the puzzle box includes a few elements that are printed in different colors. This isn't necessary for the puzzle solution, although it does make solving the puzzle easier on the eyes. If you're printing this on a single color printer, I recommend using a light filament color, so surface decorations are easier to read. And if you're printing this on a multicolor printer, use high contrast color schemes. An onyx box with charcoal highlights won't be fun to solve. When applying colors to the model, you might find part names added to the 3MF file. Don't worry about reading these. The names are sufficiently vague to avoid spoiling the puzzle solution. Since this is a puzzle, how can you tell if the print was successful? Well, the six dials should rotate freely. And if they don't, you may be able to free them up with a little twist. The bottom of each dial has a slot for a coin or flathead screwdriver to unstick minor jams. The central core of the puzzle should be able to lift a few millimeters above its printed position. If your print passes both of these checks, then it's probably good to go. That's it for the non-spoiler portion of the video. If you want to solve the puzzle for yourself, stop here and head to the video description for links to download the model. And good luck! Now for everyone else, let's get to the puzzle solution. This puzzle is a multi-step combination lock. Progress requires turning the right dials, the right distances, at the right times. Just guessing an answer isn't much fun, so the code is hidden in the puzzle itself. The large glyph at the center is a hint for our first combination. All six dials include this symbol, a hexagon that's been split into six triangles. When you rotate each dial until the symbol faces the center, the core drops a short distance, indicating that progress was made. The remaining combinations are a bit trickier. There are six glyphs on the outer wall of the puzzle, but there's no obvious order to them, and none of the glyphs match the dial symbols. With a little exploration, you'll find two subtle hints for the next step. When the core is raised to its highest point, you can find a few triangles carved into only one side. And when the core is lowered, 
we'll see two triangles carved into the puzzle frame on that same side. Both of these indicators serve the same purpose. They tell us which of the six glyphs we should focus on. This one. The glyph is a combination of multiple dial symbols merged together. In this case, an arrow and two opposing triangles. Point those symbols to the center of the puzzle and the core falls a little further. In this lowered position, the core reveals a new pair of indicator triangles, telling us that this glyph is next. This is a combination of an asterisk and two solid opposing triangles. When we rotate these two symbols toward the center, the puzzle doesn't advance. That's because the dials from the previous step are still messing up the combination. Let's return those to their neutral positions and the core falls again. From here on out, we'll follow every successful step with returning all the dials to their neutral positions. So far so good, but the next glyph is a curveball. At first glance, it looks like no combination of symbols can possibly create this shape. We can almost get there by combining an S symbol with a three-line spark, but it leaves an extra line that happens to be shared by both symbols. Let's give it a try. Rotating both dials advances the puzzle. This step teaches us that overlapping elements in merged symbols cancel each other out. That lesson is reinforced by our next glyph. This pointy letter M can be created by merging a three-triangle pinwheel with a three-triangle strut. In this case, five overlapping elements were eliminated, making this a trickier combination to find. With only two glyphs to go, it's time to throw another curveball. The next glyph looks incredibly simple, but it can only be created using three dials, four solid triangles, three solid triangles, and an empty hexagon. As you can see, the more elements you add, the more overlaps we encounter, leading to more obscure solutions. Our final glyph tests that lesson again. This glyph is a combination of the Z symbol with two opposing triangles and two solid opposing triangles. Once these dials are in place, the core drops out and gives us access to a slide out bin. And the puzzle is solved. For my print, I added some 6 by 3 millimeter magnets to the drawer. These are completely optional. I just like the solid feel they give to the final step. If you have some lock picking skills, it is possible to solve this puzzle without juggling those symbols in your head. I won't reveal the exact technique here, but I will say that relying purely on feel could lead you into some dead ends. But if you manage to circumvent those traps, that's still a valid solve in my mind, so good job. In a few moments, I'm going to close out the video with our usual feature print segment. This week, it's going to include photos from all the people who printed the prototype puzzle box and sent their results in. I want to give an extra thanks to all those makers. I think you'll notice quite a few improvements to the final design based on your feedback. Everyone who prints the final version of the puzzle benefits from that help. Thank you. Until next time, happy printing and thanks for stopping by. Thanks for sticking around to the end. Since you did, here are just some of the prototypes that went into making the final design, including this my very first prototype print for this project. Originally, the puzzle required simultaneously turning multiple dials at once. Unfortunately, it had a tendency to jam, so I decided to switch to the gravity system you see here. Hopefully you'll agree that all the work was worth it. Okay, see you later. <laughs>